All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to our Hot Glass Show. Welcome to our uh, Bring the Heat demonstration. My name is Tom Ryder. I'm pretty excited to be leading the team here. We've got George Kennard and Helen Tegler as well. Um, yeah, we've done, all of us have really done a lot of these demonstrations and assisted all these different guest artists. I was kind of thinking about it all today, about literally hundreds of guest artists that have done a demonstration that got live streamed similar to this. And now uh, I get to show you guys some of my ideas. So we'll be making two big pieces. So we did actually a lot of prep work. We've been working for three hours so far on some of the prep work that we've done just to kind of make this demonstration fun, fast, and kind of snappy and move through the process. There's some, there's some long and complicated color work that we just did on uh, a lot of these pieces. And uh, we did that all before the show. So you don't really need to sit through a half hour, 45 minutes of me mixing some colors. We've got um, a bunch of different things. I've got a couple examples here, kind of on the, the front of the stage. We'll be making a version first of my uh, tree vase. I can see on the screens you guys are coming on in. So it's a square vase. So there, there you go, you got some images up on the screen. A square vase with the tree imprint, the stick imprint. We use actual sticks inside of a mold that I made. Actually, I made this mold, I was thinking about it, I made this mold 13 or 14 years ago at the Pilchuck Glass School in, in Washington State. So uh, this, I've had this mold for a while, but Today, we're doing some new colors going in, into this mold. So I'm, I'm pretty excited to show you guys this process. I will kind of jump on and off the microphone a little bit. Uh, we're going to kind of leave most of it up to Helen and George to chat. We're making some big pieces, and I, I feel like I'll just be huffing and puffing inside the microphone for you guys. So I'm pretty excited to show you some, some cool things. We've got lots of uh, kind of irons in the fire all around our studio here and we'll we'll get started. We'll gather up and we'll be hitting this big mold in just a few minutes actually. So here we go. All right. So this is actually, yes, going to be a really fun project here and it's a bonus show getting two pieces in one demonstration here today. So definitely stick with us throughout the course of the um, morning. Also keep in mind that this will eventually go up on our YouTube channel, so you can uh, reference this if there's a little key thing that you might have missed or you want to just watch the whole thing again. Uh, it usually takes at least a week to get back up onto our YouTube channel, but there's hours and hours of uh, referenceable material there on that YouTube channel. Speaking of visiting artists, we have uh, lots of archived videos there as a good resource for everyone. And we see the numbers ticking up on them every day. So it's really exciting to see that we're reaching so many people from far and wide uh, with our programming here at the Corning Museum of Glass. So really honored to have Tom uh, joining those ranks here this morning. So it all starts out with uh, the little bit of color. And as he mentioned, we did some prep work before the show started. Um, and that's just to keep the slow things. <laughs> like putting color together can usually be a little bit of a slower and less exciting process. So we wanted to get some of that stuff done so we could keep more action into our morning. Um, but we started out with solid color. One of the really beautiful things about this series, um, actually both these, these series that Tom has been working on, is the background color. And so he's experimented with a couple different combinations. And it's um, usually using jewel tones of some sort and transparents in particular. And when you start to lay those transparents on top of each other, mix them slightly, you get this really beautiful marbled effect. And so he's taken, uh, which one are we starting with actually? We'll start with the tree vase. The tree vase, but is this reds or blues? Blues. Blues, okay, that's what I was thinking. You were gonna go for blues today. So the blue one has um, three different uh, blues in it, uh, predominant and then two uh, minor colors. But by the time you mix these together, the blues give the illusion of maybe 10 different blues because you're working with concentrations, you're working with overlap. He has uh, a layer of white to start with. That's how we started this whole process was with a really thin layer of white glass on the surface of a clear bubble. 
And so the backdrop is kind of like putting gesso onto a canvas, just giving yourself a really good backdrop for the future color. And so he's got this beautiful layer of solid white and then the overlay of the slightly mixed colors. Once he attaches those colors and gets the overlay all set, that's the thin layer pushing glass over the surface of the bubble to create that thin layer. Then he actually kind of dug into it with a pair of tweezers. If you imagine uh, a marshmallow and the core is maybe not quite as melty as the surface, the surface is really hot, you grab it and move it around. Well, he's got a little bit of color on the surface that he pinched and pulled and moved around, so it has these little striations. It creates part of the marble effect. It's not just a twist, it's a purposeful grab and placement. So when you get that little grab mark, uh, it digs into the clear or to the white just enough to kind of intermix that into the surface of the blues. Unfortunately, a lot of the colors won't be very evident while we're working with them this morning. The blue vase will look very green throughout the process of making it. But uh, you've got these wonderful samples down here. You're welcome to take a closer look at if you're in here in-house. And of course, um, you can always check out Tom Ryder Art. He's got a website with lots of examples of these types of work um, in his uh, social media as well. So to make any big piece, we just need to have lots of glass. So he'll start out here this morning by gathering that first layer of clear glass over the surface of all that color, getting the bubble established slightly in the inside, and then we'll start to gather up additional glass. Now for 2,000 years, we've been blowing glass. We've been blowing through hollow stainless steel pipes. Well, maybe not for 2,000 years with a stainless steel, but we've been working with um, glass blowing for many, many years. And it is only now, this year, that we had to shift the way that we're blowing glass. Wearing masks, we're no longer able to blow into those pipes ourselves. So we've got alternate inflation devices that we're using here. It's just a little uh, air compressor. There's a foot pedal down below um, his bench that activates, activates some of that uh, air pressure. Pretty low pressure. We're only working with one or two pounds here this morning for inflation. Doesn't take a whole lot of pressure to blow up a vessel as long as it's nice and hot. We might need to turn it up a little bit there you go, later on, as we scale up on the work. Just using a little bit of compressed air to slightly cool this glass as well, but that pressure is really, really high. If we tried to actually inflate with that kind of pressure, this bubble would get really big really quickly and be very difficult to control. One advantage that they've come up with different systems, different shops have been working on these alternate blowing devices. And I know over at the studio of the Corning Museum of Glass, they've hooked up two of them so that you can have a high pressure and a low pressure or two slightly different pressures. That's helpful for things like going into molds, doing production. So I'm sure there's many, many shops out there that are acclimated into these new ways of working. So we do have a few people here in the audience, so we welcome you here to the Corning Museum of Glass. If you folks have any questions throughout the course of the morning, please feel free to get my attention. My name's Helen. We're doing a special uh, live stream um, demonstration here with Tom Ryder and George Kennard on the assist here today. Online, of course, we've got opportunity to answer any of your questions as well. Got Amanda on the helm here, and anything she doesn't know how to answer, she always asks us, and we can help answer those questions as well. So please reach out with those curiosities. Just remember, it's a family show, folks, so be kind. Be kind.
So this is going to be a mold blown piece. You want some more air? I'm just standing here leaving you going. We put a brand new paper here today, so it's really smoky. Tom will go home smelling of burnt paper here today. It's actually one of those things that I really loved in college when I first started blowing glass. Just all the smells that you'd have in the studio. And I'm not just talking about the glass blowers because that's a whole other conversation. But just the smell of beeswax and burnt paper. A little bit of that metallic smell from all of the, the pipes. Yeah, a little strip gather on top of this. But you can always know when you've got a good day in the studio. You go home and you smell like burnt paper. Smell like fire and beeswax. Mm -hmm. We don't need any. Mm. All right, so I think he's got at least one more gather. Just one more, right? Yeah, so this is our third gather. We're going to go for a fourth gather. Those first gathers being a little smaller to control the color. But you'll notice as he goes to gather, um, you can gather and keep everything, or you can gather and strip gather is what we call it. So we drain some of that glass back into a bucket. Now by draining that glass into the bucket, you get a really nice even coating of glass. Now you gather, of course, and you try to keep it even as you gather, but this is just a really great way of creating a thin layer on the surface of all of um, the rest of that color and glass. All the clear glass here at the studio, we do recycle that. We'll put that back into our furnace uh, even some of our demonstration pieces, eventually, if they're clear and we don't end up using them for any purpose, we might crush those up as well, put them back into our furnace. Clear glass and, is, and glass in general is really infinitely remeltable. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. He said he wanted to point out that we keep these pieces pretty thick because they are mold blown and then they get finished in the cold shop. So the very top of the, the vessels, the squareness, you could transfer it over onto a punny and uh, kind of open it up and coax it into that square form. But it's really nice how Tom finishes these pieces. They end up having these really sharp top edges cold works them into a nice square edge with a perfect polish. So it shows kind of the internal uh, color striations on this piece as well. So this mold is made of wood. As Tom said, it's been about 15 years since he made this. And it, you can tell, it's getting a bit soaked in. <laughs> Wood's starting to soften just a little bit. A lot of times these uh, wooden molds will spend most of their life in water. If they get dried out, they'll start to crack. It can cause problems. just like our wooden blocks that we use at the very beginning of every process. We need to roll the glass into those wooden blocks just to help shape, center, and cool the glass. A video shot of the inside of the mold before we go into it. All right, I'm not sure if we can focus. Do we have the ability to see that? There we go. So you can see this is a, a four-part mold that comes apart. Actually, the lid would be different. And he's 
used some um, natural branches here on the inside, and he's just stapled them into place. So that's what really is so nice about this piece. He's got, of course, the basic squared shape, um, and each one will be pretty similar in its size and consistency, so it's great for that production angle. But each one of the branches, of course, are put in separately. So each one of these pieces ha is unique to itself and really captures that nature that he's trying to emulate. So even with a production item, I think this is a really, or something you could turn into a production item, it's a really nice element to make each one unique, not only in the, in the branches and the use of those branches, but also of course, in all these unique color patterns and combinations. It's almost impossible to make every color pattern exact, so um, it's, it's kind of a lovely surprise to see all of the different options that come through, through practice. But even with a mold, you need to essentially set up that bubble. So we're going to start that jack line. Constrictions help us direct breaking later on. We do need some structure on this once it comes out of the mold. We have some additional coloration to add. you too soon there. Okay. George, you want to move the uh, air? Oh, yeah, the foot pedal. So one of those new challenges of realizing that we need to have our foot pedal everywhere we go. this mold. It's nice and wet. It's got all that Ready? steam that'll help it keep it from sticking. Oh, great shot. All right, down into the mold. He's using that press compressor, air compressor. This is kind of the tricky thing we, des we figured out during some of our rehearsals, is usually when the gaffer is blowing, I think we're probably pretty good, they can feel the pressure. But with the automated system, it's a little harder to tell that pressure. But it looks pretty good. Let's give them a big round of applause. What do you think, folks? Beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful. I'm gonna get this mold back into the water. Get those branches nice and wet, and now start shaping up the rest of this piece. So, great inflation there. It didn't collapse, it was good timing. Now, since those branches are stapled into the inside of the mold, Sometimes they have a tendency to stick, but it looks like we didn't have too many sticking there either. Yeah, didn't get any of them. Well, let me push on the bottom. Super clean. Now this is the type of piece that we don't want to get real hot again. We don't want to lose all that beautiful texture that's on the surface. So while he still has the heat, he'll make sure everything is nice and flat. Sit proudly on the table. 
And now we have all this beautiful texture. And part of that texture, again, is the branches. And so we have our samples down here. And I'll put one on the marver here. I don't know if that's the easiest place to focus in or not or not. But you can see these branches that are along the surface of our glass. And so right now, they're just all clear. So they don't show up as clearly and most evident um, as what this does, because this has a little bit of powder worked into the surface. So this is what they're going to do over on that side. Is that on? So they've got a little bit of black powder. Now it is powdered glass. We make colored glass by mixing metallic oxides into the raw materials of glass. And we don't make our color here, we buy it. And so we buy it from manufacturers, a couple of different uh, manufacturers of color around the world. But it's consistent, so we know what we're ordering, we can get a consistent color. And we can get that color anywhere from a powder, like we're using here, all the way to big chunks or pea gravel size frit. These little particles and little broken pieces, each one will give you a slightly different effect. And what's lovely about using powder is that it, it does give you a real painter, painterly effect. And you can see that he's using some newspaper or a rag to just wipe away the powder that was on the surface. So just like uh, doing printmaking or something, you kind of rub the ink off the surface and only it sits into the recesses of that uh, plate that you're going to print with. Well, the same kind of idea. We're using this powder, sifting it into, onto the surface, and then wiping it away from the very surface so it'll just remain as that beautiful kind of branch texture on the inside. He has chosen a black powder as well, so great contrast. And it goes just a little bit metallic. Sometimes the metals will come to the surface that are, that are a part of that color, giving you kind of a mirrorized or um, textured effect. By not really getting it super hot, it also leaves just a little bit of texture or tooth in the um, design. And yes, we are doing this in a powder booth. Silicosis is a big concern. Loose powders and silica dust, we want to avoid breathing it as much as we can. So we've got this really nicely constructed booth that just sucks all the powder and all those particulates away from us and down into um, a containment unit. So do we have, we've got quite a few new people who have joined us here in the amphitheater. Is there any questions so far, folks, that we can answer for you? Of course, online, you're welcome to chime in at any point. Amanda hasn't asked me too many questions, so I assume she's handling all the good questions today. Yes. That's great, good, great observation. So I said I, we didn't want to get it hot again, so we didn't lose that texture, but he is obviously going into the furnace. So how am I, how am I being a liar in that aspect, right? Well, the difference is, is that you can get glass really hot and get it moving, or you can just kind of keep it warm to keep it from cracking. Our soda lime glass expands a little bit as it heats and it shrinks a little as it contracts. So if it starts to get too cold, say below 1,000 degrees, that's where that shrinking starts to happen. So if this piece were to be left out for too long, one, it would start to get too cold. It would start to shrink and that could crack. But the color also only sticks to warm glass or hot glass. So we're giving it enough heat to keep it from cracking and giving just enough heat on the surface to get the color to stick to that surface but if we get it too hot, that's where we start to move it and, and reshape it and lose some of that texture. So glass blowing really is all about controlling temperature. And by having it go through liquid, solid, and back again states, we can um, pretty much make anything that we want out of glass. So for just the audience that's here with us uh, in-house, I don't know if you'll see this or not, I'll just do a quick drip on the Marver, just show you just how quite fluid this material is. They've got four sides. They're going to keep um, rubbing that powder into the sides. 
But you can see fresh from the furnace, it's about 2,100 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's about like honey. So it's really runny when it's fresh from the furnace. But as it starts to cool and stabilize, it can drip off. I can already see it starting to lose some of that temperature. So I can pick it up. And you can see all those little squiggles. Now those are cold enough, I can actually start to touch them there because they've hardened. But they're still pretty hot over here on the pipe. Now if I go back into that furnace, it'll start to rewarm that glass. It'll start to move. You can see it's already starting to shift its, its uh, movement because of the heat. So that's really what we're doing. We're going back and forth between keeping it mo mobile where we want to change it, keeping it stable where we've already accomplished what we want to accomplish, and uh, keeping those items ready to go. I guess we're done with these stairs too, huh? Roll these out of the way, give you a little better view. So it looks like they've finished up adding all the powder. So now it's just gonna be a matter of a couple of flash heats. Again, this is not a piece that we're going to transfer over onto a punty. We're not gonna finish up the top half hot. It's going to be a process that's done cold. So he'll take this finished bubble that he's got on the pipe and just saw off the top of the vessel. So we use diamond saws to cut through the glass. And then he'll use uh, different abras abrasion technologies, usually a diamond pad, to be able to um, really clean up that line, get it nice and shiny, get it nice and crisp. So even once finished in the hot shop, still got hours of work to do. <laughs> Some people really hate cold working. You talk to a lot of glass blowers, glass blowers will say, oh, that cold working is my least favorite part. But um, I think that there's also uh, such lovely things that can be done in the cold shop. And I know Tom gravitates toward the cold shop for doing quite a few um, things in his work. It's a great way of adding texture and different details, cutting parts up and reassembling them or just cleaning up those unsightly punny scars or making the tops of those pieces just so elegant. So really need to make sure that that powder is melted in without disturbing the texture. So that's where he's gonna start using the torch just to reinforce some of that heat on a big piece like this, it's sometimes difficult to get the exact heat exactly where you want it. So that's where that torch comes in, really helpful. This is a gas and oxygen torch. Burns very, very hot, and we often use it to just help spot heat specific areas. It's originally designed for flame working. We have great demonstrations here at the museum um, doing flame working uh, every single day here up in our innovations area. We also have a few demos on our YouTube channel. You can help reference uh, all kinds of exciting opportunities here at the museum and of course from the studio and a lot of their workshops as well. And well. We did actually have one of our original Bring the Heat uh, artists. It was Eric Goldschmidt. He's one of our full-time flame workers here at the museum. And we've got another flame working demonstration coming up. I believe it's the 24th, whatever the Wednesday is, towards the end of the month. Caitlin Hyde will be featured artist doing one of these Bring the Heat and we'll be working together. I'll be helping her by making some bottles for her uh, beautiful stoppers featuring some of her lovely characters and illustrations that she does. So I think they're coming in on the final rounds here. A couple final flashes balancing out the temperatures 
we want to make sure that we put this away for slow cooling, but we want to make sure that it doesn't change shape once we put it away for slow cooling. So George is getting all dressed up in some protective gear here. So you can grab hold of this piece, load it into our annealing oven. And then they'll cool down slowly. We'll probably put these on a 24 hour cycle. So this is some of the complicated parts and components that we have. And again, it's a mixture of blue glasses that he put onto the surface. So I know it looks like a little bit of orange, a little bit of green, but he's got a mixture of blue glass on the surface. So remember, we got a bonus show here today as well. Once Tom finishes, Puts this one away. We've got another piece all on the ready. A little bit of water, like that. There we go. Beautiful job. Let's give it up for Tom Ryder. Beautiful. Um, plenty of time. We were debating whether we'd have time to do another uh, bonus element or not, but I think we're going to start out before we assemble uh, this next piece is to actually make a flower. So Tom does uh, a lot of objects here. Oh, thanks, George. That have additions. He likes to make flowers. He likes to make um, those trees really harnessing nature very often for inspiration for his work. So as a precursor, just to make sure that we had everything we needed, we actually made a couple of the flowers that he'll need for this vessel and put them away into one of our pickup boxes and it'll keep those flowers safe, warm, and happy. But we thought that the folks at home and here in house might be interested in seeing how one of these flowers are put together. What size flower are we doing here, Tom? Okay, so like that. Okay. All right, so Tom wants to jump back on and introduce the next piece, maybe tell you a little bit about those other exciting things that you've been doing lately. Always busy. Yep. Oh, guys, always busy. Yeah, very true. Awesome. All right, so one uh, successful piece in the box. I was really happy with that one, the, co the color mixture. Of all those really soft blue colors is kind of always a bit of a gamble and uh, that one went really nice and smooth so I'm really happy with that. I think we got our work kind of off off to the right off on the right foot here really so uh, yeah so we're gonna make a flower and uh, like when we're doing all these demonstrations I start thinking about you know how I kind of learned how to make these flowers um, Glass blowing is one of those things where there's not really a textbook. We're kind of always learning from each other, learning from the people that have uh, shown you how to do these things. So I was thinking somewhere around 2007, 2008, um, Amy Rufert and Kate Rhodes did an artist residency here at the museum and I came from Alfred. Alfred's real close, maybe less than an hour drive down the road. and. Uh, I used to come from Alfred and assist some of the artists and residents just to learn as much as possible. I saw Amy Rufert make a flower in this style. Shortly after uh, graduating, we started the cruise ship program here at the museum, blowing glass on three big, beautiful cruise ships and traveling around the world. That's where I got the opportunity to work with Bob Swidergall. Good ended up being ends up being a really good friend of all of us here at the museum. Yeah, Bob. And yeah. 
Um, and Bob was sculpting a flower in kind of a similar fashion. So this is a little bit of a, a combination of a flower I saw Amy make and a flower I saw Bob make and kind of make things your, your own style a little bit as much as, you, as much as you can. So this is a bit sculpted flower. I have a little center piece and Helen has a big additive bit. So we're gonna add all these bits of glass onto the piece. And uh, yeah, the, we try to make these look kind of natural. Helen has a bit of alabaster glass and a mix of a purple and blue color. And we kind of put the color onto these flowers, however it lands. So we'll chop a couple bits of glass and add, those will be petals. So get put the petals all the way back towards the back end of the pipe and start adding these little tiny bits. But yeah, we've got, I've, I always kind of have a lot of things going on, that's for sure. We, I don't like to sit still, really. So there's all these silver lining things of 2020. We ended up sitting at home a whole lot, and I don't like that. So I started applying myself, applying to shows and artist residencies, and gosh, I probably sent out 20 different applications when we're sitting at home, not doing too much. And we started getting some uh, interesting feedback. Um, Habitat Gallery, a, a world-renowned glass gallery, the bit largest and I believe oldest one still around. Habitat Galleries, I've been kind of show, I've been showing work with them. A couple different online exhibitions of some of my larger scale sculptural items. So, uh, yeah, I've been, been working with Habitat Galleries and, and showing some of my larger sculpture, which has been really gratifying. It's been really fun to see the feedback on a very different type of work that I don't get to put out there into the world so often. Uh, just yesterday, was that yesterday? Two days ago, I guess, um, I received a really nice award. So during those, sending all those applications, I sent applications out to be part of the Op Art Glass Show at the Imagine Museum in Florida. Uh, the Corning Museum of Glass has partnered with the Imagine Museum several times in the past. We've done, we've brought our mobile glass blowing studio down to the Imagine Museum and did, did glass blowing demonstrations. So if a museum doesn't have a glass blowing studio, we can bring the mobile studio to them. So we've partnered with the Imagine Museum and uh, got, some, got three of those larger scale sculptures that we're showing with Habitat Galleries also got into this really amazing show at the Imagine Museum in Florida. So that's, that show is up now, that show is live and um, you can go see it or as a lot of people are still doing nowadays, you can kind of tune in to their different uh, social media channels and uh, check out some of their live streams. I'll be part of an artist panel discussion um, in March, at the beginning of, the, of March. I believe it's March 15th, but you're gonna wanna check on that online as well. So we'll be involved in the Corny Museum of Glass, the Imagine Museum, Habitat Galleries, and things are kind of always busy. Never a dull moment, that's for sure. So we're working our way through our second piece here. So this is like the smaller, more detailed component. And I feel like I've got a second to breathe and make a pretty little flower in between making some big pieces of glass, which is always a lot of fun. One of the things that I really, really enjoy. So yeah, here's our, our flower starting to come together. Uh, we sculpt over the past couple weeks. We've been practicing some of these pieces and uh, we sculpted a few. We've got a bunch of flowers. Actually, we're going to end up with an extra couple flowers. You never know. That's one of those things that you really want to you really want to be ready for any little disaster in the hot shop. So if we mess up any of the flowers, we can put a, 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 one of the extras onto this piece here. Then we can kind of pick and choose. I can pick and choose my favorite flowers. Yeah, I like to do that. Give yourself some options. Yeah. So in the heat of the moment, you get the best one that you like. Yeah. All right, so I think this is, uh, let's call this good, Helen. I like 
ha I like the balance. Ah. Usually I can uh, right. kind of take a look from the front and I like. So now we just need to add a few green leaves on there. Yep, we'll put a couple green leaves on this one. Then we'll put it in a kiln. The kiln will kind of babysit these flowers until we're ready to apply them onto the big sunset vase, one of my favorite pieces. So that was one of the pieces actually that was inspired by our travels with the museum's mobile studios, either on board the cruise ships or um, with the uh, glass lab and the mobile glass blowing studio as well. We get out into the different parts of the world and we get to see these amazing sunsets. And we'll be making the sunset vase next. I'm excited about it. It's my favorite piece to show people. Yeah, I think everyone who worked out on ships came up with some sort of sunset yeah. version of something. It was such a beautiful imagery standing off the back of the ship, sailing away, the sunset, and locales around the world. You really can't help but be inspired. So one final little bit. I really like the subtle use of color with these flowers as well. You've got just that tiny bit of color Purple is it, right? Over top, it's a mix of blues and purples over top of that alabaster. Alabaster is such a lovely luminescent color. But just a hint of the blue and purple to accent this. Not another tiny but mighty round of applause from our in-house folks here. And of course at home you can cheer all you want as well. You can be even more embarrassing at home because nobody's there to watch. So just let the love fly. So now that we've got our flower, we've already got um, the color pattern all worked up. And is there anything you'd like to say about the choices of colors here today or anything? Yeah, sure. So. A lot of the, uh, oftentimes in glass, we could use these beautiful jewel and gem tones, and I always like to back them with a little bit of enamel white. Just really let it pop. And uh, this piece in particular with the sunset vase, a lot of it is about that glass and glass and light. So if this piece is lit the right way, it'll glow like a sunset. That's the general idea. So a little bit of white behind some of those jewel tones will really make it pop. So we do a white overlay, then we do an uh, overlay with two colors. This piece has uh, gold ruby and uh, yellowish aurora. So that's new for me as well. I used to use gold topaz, but it was a little muddier. It was a little darker. So we're using the yellowish aurora and the gold ruby over top of enamel white. And uh, it takes 20 or 25 minutes to kind of swirl up these colors and I always get air bubbles and doesn't look so good so I pick all the little air bubbles out make sure it's crisp and clean and nice looking and once it is nice and clean we threw this these color patterns these starts into the garage where we could pick them back up and 
kind of like a cooking show. We kind of fast forward through the sort of boring part, I guess. All right, so I'm going to take a gather. I'll pass the microphone back off to Helen or George, and we'll, we'll keep rolling. We'll take a couple big gathers and make a nice big vase. All right. Oh, you do need it? I'm sorry. I thought you only needed the brown. So we do have a couple more bits to be added to this next piece. I was trying to clean house and I was cleaning it too quickly. Put away my green color. So time to load up a couple layers of clear glass on top of all that beautiful color. Another thing that I really love about these pieces is that you leave them just a little bit on the thicker side, so it really gives a chance for that color to be so proud, so dense. I love that kind of density of just even the clear glass on top of the color, the depth that's created by the use of clear glass. So as we layer up these layers of glass, um, since he's using a newspaper, he's using wooden blocks, there's other uh, tools that are being implemented here that could leave just a little bit of ash on the surface. So we often, if we're not even reshaping too much, we'll go for a quick flash of heat just to kind of burn off any of that residual uh, surface. That way as we go gathering up these layers, uh, we don't really see the layers. Sometimes you can leave a little haze in between the layers if you're not careful about burning off some of that surface. Now one of the challenging things that comes together with these pieces and really any pieces using color as well is that the color itself, it, run and move, it wants to move differently in the heat sometimes. Now we just finished a beautiful blue combination and blues have a uh, tendency to be really soft and so they, they sometimes want to move easier in some areas than others. But anytime you're mixing these colors, then you're creating slight inconsistencies, things that you have to kind of battle against while you're blowing. But that's another smart move of using that white as a background, not only helping those colors pop, it also just adds a little bit of stability, kind of brings everything to an even spot at the very beginning. All right, so the family has arrived. <laughs> the little Tommy Ocho. Here to watch Pops blow some glass. Yeah, definitely not standing still these days. Tom's young son is just learning to walk these days, so he's been telling us stories about the adventures, no longer sitting him, staying where he's sat. It's all chase at this point. Mm -hmm.
All right, so we've got a nice stable bubble. We'll go back into that furnace. Are we gathering this the last gather? Or? Yeah, it's just this is the final gather for this piece. So once we get this final gather, you'll start to see the process move through uh, a little quicker. We often need to have that core heat. We want to make sure that we are using that core heat to our advantage. Take a little time to cool that pipe off slightly to make sure that we can grab it safely. We often have a lot of folks ask us why we're not wearing gloves while we're blowing glass. And the simplest answer is we need that dexterity. We need to be able to turn the pipe. But if you're on the end of a four foot pole, then that's going to be pretty far away. It's not a very ergonomic approach. So you wanna be able to hold that pipe as close to the weight as possible. So using a little bit of water, our pipe cooler. Much safer option. This is one advantage that we have found in using this new system. We're using alternate inflation devices, not being able to um, blow into the pipes ourselves. So we're of course wearing masks like everyone is these days. But one advantage is you can actually add some air pressure while you're working uh, at what I call the business in. Now of course George could have bent down, blowing into that pipe for Tom. But that's a bit of a miss, or a bit of communication that was required during that time frame, even if we didn't have masks on. So it gives Tom a little bit more control. He can add air whenever he feels it's necessary, even just tiny little increments to help keep things structural as we're blowing. I've actually found in, in using this system for production, it's kind of sped up things just a little bit for some of our gaffers that are making production over in the studio. So, as you mentioned earlier, silver linings. It's definitely, certainly been a silver lining for us here. fluffy torch here. This isn't going to get nearly the temperatures that we have with that hot torch. So it's really more of a, a warm-up. So by adding just a little bit of extra heat on the top edge of this, this bubble, it'll be easier to cut the jack line in, helping shape the glass without getting the tip too hot. We don't have a question? So there was some question on whether these pieces would be for sale or not. So Tom wanted to make sure everybody knows that there are similar pieces for sale in our shop. Um, you probably couldn't even find those online if you're not local, can't come in and see it for yourself. But Tom is uh, a big 
production artist, he does make a lot of work, and we do have a lot of those items for sale here at the museum. But he also, of course, maintains his own business. So you can check, up, check out uh, TomRiderArt.com. They've got a great Etsy store. Lots of opportunity to collect Tom Ryder work. But as bring the heat, there are a few items um, that if they come out all right and everything, they do end up uh, for sale as features on our website and here in house. So if you're looking for something special, we do represent a lot of um, independent artists here at the museum. There's lots of really wonderful things to collect. In addition to the amazing collection that we have to just come look at here at the Corning Museum of Glass. I think that's one thing all of us would agree upon is that this is a very inspiring place. And we can just wander through. between the library for re references, the classes that we offer, all of the hours of YouTube channel referencing things that we can look at, and just looking at the amazing things in our collection and our visiting artist programs. Okay. Tom said he's got a really good setup for the dropout. Often it's not the exact move that you're doing that requires perfection. It's all the setup to that move that requires uh, the forethought, putting, setting forth all the conditions to get just the right kind of movement, using that torch, using that paper, using air using the marver, it's all in pursuit of the temperature, getting just the right temperature you're looking for. Because of course, temperature is how we shape the glass. When it's hot, it moves very easily. And even the difference between this morning's first piece with using those blues and then the second piece here, then the second piece using some uh, reds and ambers, That'll change how the glass moves. And of course, the beginning of the day, the end of the day, the reheating chambers might be slightly different temperatures. So one of the good signs of a good glass blower is watching them constantly acclimate. They kind of register those temperatures, register the colors, visual cues. And they work hot. This is really going to look like a sunset and all these striations. It's a beautiful drop out. Now we can start to focus on bringing the belly of that piece out a little bit. Stabilizing the top half. As we've mentioned, nothing gets too cold as we're working. We can't let the top get too cold as we're working. But he'll focus a lot of heat on the bottom half now to be able to get that to round up. So we got a question about Tom's favorite piece he's ever made. And what was the title again? Interactive, Interactive Ambiance. 
You can find it on YouTube. Interactive ambiance, Tom Ryder. You should be able to find it on YouTube because he Piano Center Stage. Ah, each piece of each key on the piano lights up different blown glass pieces in the environment. That does sound familiar. I think I must have seen that at some point in your collection. That sounds like a something you might have done while you were at Alfred. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Many glass workers learn the craft in universities, and Tom attended Alfred University, which is a very popular and very uh, prestigious university, pretty close to here in Corning. Angus Powers heads up that program. He's got a wonderful sense of humor and play in his glass and inspires that in his students as well. started now on what will be the foot of this vessel. So George gathered up a bit of clear glass. We're going to coat this with gold brown, I believe. Is that what we're working with? Gold brown? So gold brown. Yeah. It's a lovely transparent that actually goes kind of opaque. Depends on how it's heated, how it's treated, how much color is on there. It can go real metallic. It can even have hints of blue, kind of oceanic on the surface. bigger one of these vessels Tom set made I just mentioned oh this one's a pretty big one he's like yeah I got really excited <laughs> it's always exciting to blow glass have a team feature what we love and share it with those tuning in in online and of course in house it's a great time to come visit the museum in these slightly uh, quieter summer hours We just put up a brand new display uh, for the Blown Away season two. Just dropped on Friday. All of us have been really excited to see that Netflix series. See ourselves on TV and see our friends in the competition. A team of glassmakers from Corning went to assist on the final episode of last, last season and this season. So the first two seasons. Well, we've set up a display here at the museum. If the uh, glass blowing and the excitement of the museum isn't enough to entice you to come visit, maybe the blown away display will be as well. But we've got one piece from each of the 10 contestants uh, that competed on that show. We've got those on the display.
Okay, so Tom's been doing some good stabilizing, making sure everything's all set and ready to go. George has that foot coated with color, pre-shaped slightly. Are we dropping it here? Yeah, talking yeah. like So we're gonna be picking this uh, foot up off of the marber. Excuse me, got pickups all of a sudden. a good hit there, lining it right up. Nice job, nice job team, nice job. So now that that is attached to the bottom, they can square that up. And then we're getting ready to transfer this over. Now once we've got this beautiful vase switched around, we still have to open up the top. We've got a beautiful lip wrap to be added to the top edge. And then don't forget all those flowers. And in advance of our demonstration today, he made a couple flowers. We made one right before this piece started. Hopefully you got a chance to see that. If you tuned in a little bit later than when we started, uh, this is Tom Ryder and he is making an amazing sunset vase. We were able to make those flowers in advance, put them away, but he did make one here on the live stream. So if you'd like to tune in and rewatch that, this will be online in a week or two. already see a little bit of that reduction happening on the foot just from the burning of the paddle that he used so it is a reduction color we'll get some really fun metallics on the surface but because that color is on the very surface when we go to transfer um, over onto a putty we want to make sure that that color stays on the surface and gold brown, a couple of the other soft colors, they have a ten tendency to peel away from the surface. So by putting a little clear patch here on the bottom, that'll just protect that color, giving us a good solid foundation to add the punchy to. Now, unlike the first piece that we did that gets a lot of cold working done to it to finish it off the very top it's chopped and ground this piece would be preferable not to have to cold work it so he spends a little time making sure that the bottom is nice and flat we've got a little dome area on the bottom to keep it from sticking out while we do the transfer and especially with the addition of all these delicate flowers that we're going to be added to the outside the least amount of post-production work possible. So 
George is going to start gathering up that transfer iron now. Most pieces are traded from iron to plenty, about halfway through. So punnies are meant to be very delicate and temporary. You roll them on the table to chill them slightly, create structure. This particular piece with having uh, a lot of additions that are going to be added to it and the solid nature of the foot, we can go a little bit more sturdy on this punny. A little more insurance makes the second half of the process a little less stressful. little water and it should only take a light tap to get this to remove. There we go, nice job. The virtual crowd goes wild. Yeah, I was just gonna put this. We got lots of beautiful color left on this iron from this process. We're actually just going to put that into the garage. We've got two big moils worth the color there from the first one. All those beautiful blues. This one's got all these beautiful ambers and pinks. So all that excess on the moil, we can uh, reuse that later on today. We've got lots of demonstrations left throughout our day here at the Corning Museum. So it's a great efficient use of all that beautiful color. It takes, as he said, uh, 20 minutes approximately to get all the colors on there, get them mixed in that beautiful patterning. So now he'll be able to make a small piece to match. Color can be one of the more expensive materials that we use uh, here in the shop. Now I'm not counting the gas or the electric bill, that's really something, a different discussion, but of material wise, the clear glass is relatively inexpensive. But the color comes with the use of metals, things like gold chloride for the beautiful pink that he's using here today. So those can be a little bit uh, pricey. Another thing that we've had to learn to adjust to slightly is not being able to use our Sofietta tool. Sofietta is a tube and a cone that we can use to reinflate areas once uh, an object's been removed from the blow pipe. So just like our original inflation is done with the alternate inflation device, we're also using compressed air to help inflate. Now he's gonna get this conditions just set just right so that he can reinflate the top edge a little bit. And this will give him a much broader opening, much more graceful piece. Hmm. How, I've got a question online. How big would the punty, or the piece have to be for the punty to not work? Well, I would say any piece can be puntied, but it might take a different kind of punty to make that happen. Now, I guess there's a certain weight, weight where there, if the team couldn't handle it or the pipes couldn't handle it or if it was too big for the reheating chamber, 
Those are all much bigger concerns. But when you're looking at punties, there's a lot of different styles. And especially if you watch a lot of sculptors, uh, people like Raven Skyver, he's going to have amazing complicated forms that you can't just put a standard dome punty on. So you just need to change your approach. Maybe it has to be a three-pronged punny or something that snorkels out in a weird direction and attaches to the side. Transferring punties is all about changing the direction in which you can heat an object, being whatever's furthest away from you, you can get really hot, while you keep what's uh, really close to you a little bit more stable. So the size of a piece, um, yes, that does grow challenging, the weight of the material has to help hold on, so you just scale up the punty to be matching the size of the weight of the material. But you also have just the, uh, the length of an object, the counterbalance. There's a lot of factors that go into it. And if we had an object that was flat and we tried to put two points, well, two points are going to pivot, three points are going to be more stable. So often you just need to shift that philosophy on how you're going to be punting a piece up rather than just thinking about uh, the weight of it being an issue. But yeah, interesting question. Keep those questions coming. that gold brown, the same color as what we put on the foot. So a good matching set. fun example. You can see how that color looks almost transparent when we add it, but it's only after it starts to heat in that it'll start to turn in, into that beautiful gold brown. Opening up this piece while George starts to work on what will be the vine. So this is a beautiful sunset vase, but it has a lot of decoration that's going to be added to it. Those beautiful flowers that we made earlier. So we just need to have a good landing spot for those. He's going to be adding a bit of texture to it. We're going to be using a Rosetta green, one of my favorite transparent greens, really bright grass green. biggest fan out there in the audience, Tom. Got a little baby Ocho. I love how these colors have stretched out along the neck of this piece. Got a really good mixture going on. 
each one of these pieces has such a unique quality to them in the way that the color comes together. And it's only semi-predictable in how that, that will come out as well. monster. <laughs> Tom's going big today. All right, so wrapping that vine all the way around. So we did go down into an optic mold pushing some of that color around onto itself. It just creates these beautiful striations in the, pe in the color. So it won't just be a solid frit stripe. What you looking for? So big piece and big bits. So we're going to work up a second one there. This gives Tom an opportunity to do some maintenance on temperature, making sure the punny is not getting too cold. As we mentioned earlier, the weight of the piece is a concern when you transfer a punty, but uh, it's really about heat maintenance and about the structure of that punty. So even a proper punny, if not kept at the right temperature, can start to separate prematurely. Come on another door? So Tom Ryder is our uh, Bring the Heat artist for this week, but we want to remind everybody that we do these live streams pretty much every Wednesday. And every other Wednesday, we have a guest artist, uh, a featured Bring the Heat artist, but then the alternate Wednesdays, we're doing our You Design It program. And this is a program that used to be only in-house. You had to come to the museum, you would do a drawing, submit that drawing, win a chance at having that design made by one of our gaffers for that You Design It program. But we've opened that up to the online as well. So it's a, for the first time ever here at the museum, you can tune in online. You can see our theme. I believe the next theme we have is uh, monsters. Something to do with monsters. I can't remember the exact title, but each Wednesday has a theme. So you can draw an illustration based on that theme, submit that to our team, and then we'll choose one of those items and make that right here on a live stream uh, or if you're in-house. We invite you, if you are uh, the chosen designer, you can come to visit and watch in person or, of course, online. And then that piece also uh, belongs to the designer in the end. So 
it's a great program. It's one of my favorites. It gives us an, an opportunity to try new things. It's usually a bit of a challenge because we only have a short amount of time to figure out how to make those objects once they are submitted. We choose the drawing on Monday and make the object on Wednesday. So we've had some really, really fun opportunities to play around. Made a flying fox with a rainbow cape a couple weeks ago. Made a beautiful flamingo. The last one we did with Chris. I'm gonna add a few leaves here as decorations in addition to the vines. So if you like to draw, if you like to uh, have a good imagination and put that down on paper, it'd be great to have a, a bunch of new submissions for that You Design It program. So please, you can find that on our website, cmog.org. Find the link and how to submit your drawings right there online. I really love these leaves that he's adding too. We have the visual texture from that uh, optic mold and the color kind of folding over, creating that crease effect. But he's also using a crimp, and a crimp gives a leaf texture. Kind of puts a vein up the middle, and then all these nice little striations on the side. up his vines and everything so we're getting close to being able to pick up those flowers and add those onto the outside of the piece and I brought them up slowly overnight in our pickup box here our test oven With all the small, delicate parts, it's really good to give it a chance to come up slowly. Uh, look at, yeah, heat it up. Let me look at it, though. Yeah. One more. really just creating the environment for these flowers. No, I'm giving another one. I'll take it right now, actually. And I like said it puts this little bit of a twist in each one of those leaves as well. It's a really nice dynamic.
minutes. We're going to give this oven just a half a second to warm up. We don't want to bring that oven up too soon. If it gets too hot for too long, those flowers will start to melt and change shape and stick in that oven. But we want it as warm as possible right before we transfer it over, right before we pull them out. We want them to be the warmest they can be. Got to get our timing just right as well. So George is going to take a final flash. has often been described as a dance. Good. Okay. All right. So this is definitely a bit of a dance coordinating between the three of us. using just a bit of clear glass as glue. And then sticking it down. Nice. I know you know you make a lot of flowers for your production stuff. Do you make do you make similar of these complicated flowers as well, or are these just are reserved for vessels? Uh, we do the complicated flowers as well. Yeah. yeah. We call them fancy flowers. Fancy flowers. I like that. Fancy yeah. flowers. Want the medium one now? Sure. Okay. He's made three different sizes here. So it's always good to get the first one, the biggest focal piece added first. And then work your way around. I think that's one of the complicated things about 
putting these nice vine bits and the leaves and being able to figure out and really pre-plan how all this is going to come together. So this is a really smart use of those paddles. You could grab them with metal tools and things, but this is a little safer. Not as much potential for cold metal touching on those beautiful, delicate leaves. George is multitasking now. He's got the babysitting duties, making sure that the piece stays warm, giving it good flashes, monitoring things with the torch, making sure the honey doesn't get too cold. The little tips of these flowers are also very delicate, so it might be giving them a little extra love. Ready? He's going to keep going. We made one flower extra as a backup and as a good display. We wanted to demonstrate how to make one of these flowers. So in between the two pieces, we were able to do that. If you missed that part of the demo, definitely check it out online the upcoming weeks when we have this posted. But he says, no flower goes unwasted. I'm going to go ahead and add that bonus flower. To our piece here. Go ahead, Court. Beautiful flowers have just a hint of purple and blue veined in between the alabaster. Good. So it'll be a beautiful contrast to all those sunset colors. Now the, the piece is in its slightly cooler state now compared to when we were really getting it to move around. So some of those colors are coming out to be close to what they will be in their final versions. Pink and ambers. Blues and greens. 
Lovely. A couple of final flashes. We've got all the decorations. I think that extra bit at the fourth flower was a nice addition. Again, Tom's got a lot of things happening these days. You definitely want to check out uh, the show at the Imagine Museum. His work with the Habitat Galleries. Check out TomRiderArt.com see all of his past work, some of his new work, and probably find links to all of that social media. He posts a lot of things that he's up to, so he's a great person to follow. Always has fun and interesting uh, objects that he's working on and experimenting with. Got a couple touches to make sure everything's just right before we load this away in our oven for slow cooling. This is a great way to really get those flowers to read as part of the piece rather than just things stuck on the piece, changing that language, that body language, flower language, just a little bit. That green is a nice soft color as well, so bends very easily with the wooden paddle. This piece will be cooled slowly in our controlled ovens and then we'll take some photographs of it and we'll post those online. So those of you that are home or here that are visiting us in person and you might not be able to come back within the next couple days to see the final piece, no worries, we'll have this right up online so you can take a closer look. And again, he does have um, not the exact piece but similar pieces this is a body of work that Tom's been developing over the last couple years inspired originally from our time on cruise ships the beautiful sunsets and beautiful tropical gardens from around the world great source of inspiration Keep an eye on our website for all the upcoming live streams. Yep. All right, quick torch on the bottom, making sure there's nothing sharp. It's a tricky one to grab. Or up and it goes. Beautiful job. Let's give it up for Dom Ryder. Amazing piece pieces today. You have anything you'd like to add to the end there, folks? You know, really all I'd like to do is thank Helen Tegler on the assist, George Kennard on the assist, everybody here at the museum. This has been an honor and a privilege. Thank you so much for tuning in online and here in person. 
Thank you very much. Thank you.